afternoon. If you could have your seat. Welcome, good afternoon, if you could have your seat so that we can start. So to everybody, a warm, a warm welcome to our beautiful reading room here in the European Parliament. Welcome to our audience also online, uh, since many people are following us on WebEx. This is after COVID now standard that we are on site and online. And it's a particular honor today to host for this event the legacy of, uh, for this event on the legacy of President Gilles Robles. It's a particular honor to have with us today in the library reading room three former vice presidents, Enrique Baron Crespo, Klaus Hensch, and Hans Gerd Pöttering. This event is an historical appraisal of the political life of Jose Maria Gilles Robles, with a particular focus on his presidency of the European Parliament. And I shall mention here uh, this publication of the EPRS that is available at the entrance of this room on the legacy of Jose Maria Gilles Robles. After an introductory message of former President Klaus Hensch, Professor Cavallero will join us and give an opening address, and it will be followed by a roundtable involving President Baron Crespo and Jaume Duc. Jaume is, as you know, Director General for Communications in the European Parliament. Uh, and is currently with our Secretary General talking about the forthcoming elections, but he will join us in a few minutes. And the discussion will be moderated by Wolfram Kaiser from the EPRS. It's the second time that we are organizing such an event on a deceased president. Lord Plum was last year, as you, rem you remember. And it's not so much uh, an event about commemoration, it's actually an event about studying, studying the legacy with a mix of academia and eyewitnesses from the time. Before moving to the event itself, let me underline uh, here the excellent cooperation between the EPRS and the former member association. We just had a work meeting with representatives of the association, and I shall mention the following. This is regular gatherings in the library. Um, the access of the former members to EPRS research. And as I uh, would like to insist on, it's a public good. So uh, I encourage you to use this uh, research and it's going to be even more important when we have the election to European Parliament next year because you are all ambassadors of Europe in your own countries. And there is a particular project which is called What Europe Does For Me. It's very easy to use and I encourage everyone to use it. It's in 24 languages. We contribute also on a regular basis to the uh, newsletter of the former member association in coordination with the Secretariat, Elisabetta, and this event is, if you like, the yearly culmination of this cooperation. Um, so this is also the last EPRS event of the year. After that, we have the Strasbourg and then the Christmas recess. And I'd like already to announce that on 11th of January 2024, we'll have here in this library reading room an event on what we call 10 issues to watch. It's 10 topics that we are exploring that are going most likely to uh, happen in the year to come, and it's going to be opened by Vice President Cajas. So, and encourage everyone, as I said, it's, a, it's an event that is also online to, to join. So I would like now to introduce uh, uh, former President Klaus Hensch, who was a president of the European Parliament, who is now president of the former member association to give a few words of introduction. And since our president, Roberta Metzola, is traveling today, she cannot be with us. Klaus Hensch will also speak on her behalf. Over to you, uh, President Hensch. Good 
Dear honorable members of parliament, dear colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to you all. We are very glad to have you here. And I have to start with one word I do absolutely not like. It is unfortunately, unfortunately, due to the previous commitments, the President of the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola, will not be able to be with us today. I have the honor of reading a message that the President asked me to convey to you. Dear former members, dear colleagues, dear friends, it's not me, it's uh, Metzola. Today's historical appraisal event in honor of Jose Maria Girobles offers an opportunity to take stock of the fact that the European Parliament is over time acquiring a history of its own. Jose Maria Girobles, who was president of the European Parliament from 1997 to 1999, and a distinguished men member of this House for 15 years passed away in February this year. This legacy is one of the having ens ensured that, the, that this House was directly involved in the negotiation of the Treaty of Amsterdam, including the inclusion of the legal basis for the adoption of the member states, which strengthened the European Parliament's independence. It was also during his presidency that Parliament contributed to the decisions relating to the entry into force of the Euro and to the start of the accession process for the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, Malta and Cyprus. This largest expansion of the European Union to date. He also led this House through the difficult months preceding the resignation of the European Commission, a crisis from which our institution, our institution, emerged stronger. We will remember him for his leg legendary charm but equally for his unwavering commitment to our shared European values and to bringing the European Parliament closer to the citizens it represents. I thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy his historical appraisal of your former president. Thank you for the applause. Before I give the floor to the other speakers, allow me as president of the Association of Former Members to conclude my intervention by quoting Jose Maria, which was uh, the second president of our Association of Former European Parliamentarians from, 96, uh, from 2006 to 2010. I quote him. The association has filled up a gap, one that would have been very regrettable. It has enabled close of us who at one time or another have represented Europeans to remain in contact and has been able to draw on the knowledge acquired over the years and ensure that it is used to consolidate this sui generis body which brings together our and channels our peace efforts. Muchas gracias, querido Jose Maria. Your legacy will be live in, on forever in this house. <laughs> now, now we all are here to hear, to hear his, this historical assessment of such an outstanding former president of the parliament.
Thank you very much, uh, President Hensch, for these uh, introductory words. We established a format for this type of event last year when earlier last year, Lord Plum, former President Lord Plum, had died. And the format is this, as I would like to explain briefly to you at the outset. We will have a 20-minute presentation by an academic who has worked in this case, uh, as I will explain in a minute, on the Spanish transition to democracy, as well as on Robles himself, his role in the European Parliament as and as president of the European Parliament. And this will then be followed by two eyewitnesses whom uh, Etienne Basso has already introduced and I will introduce later um, again when it's their turn. Uh, in fact, one, is, one of them is joining us now. Thank you very much for coming. Um, so we will start now online for medical reasons. She cannot unfortunately join us in person here in the library today. We'll start online with a presentation by Maria Elena Cavagliaro, who is an Italian professor at the University of Lewis in Rome. And Professor Cavagliaro has worked a lot about the history of the Mediter Mediterranean, the contemporary history of the Mediterranean, and particularly of Spain, particularly of the Spanish transition to democracy and also of the Socialist Party and Socialist Party cooperation. Uh, there, uh, not so much in this case the EPP and the Christian Democrats, but she has a strong focus on Spain and Spanish history in a broader European context and European integration. Um, and she's joining us now from Rome to talk for 20 minutes about the historic legacy of Gil Robles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, this introduction and uh, uh, thank you very much uh, to the um, European Parliament Research Service for this uh, invitation. So uh, I'll start uh, uh, my uh, historical appraisal on Jose Maria Gil Robles. Uh, I would like to uh, start from the present. Um, I mean, last month, as you know, uh, the European uh, Parliament has approved a resolution and has presented uh, a detailed proposal to reform the Treaty of the European uh, of the European Union and uh, the, the Treaty on the Functioning of the uh, European Union. In particular, there are uh, two proposals I would like to, uh, to just to mention, but I, which I think are connected with the work that Gil Robles did during his time in the European Presidency. Uh, so the first one is the Article uh, 17 of the uh, of the Treaty on the European Union, and the the, the idea is to uh, um, to modify this article and uh, uh, to, on the appointment of the president of the European uh, Commission. Uh, the EP proposal is to attributing the power to propose a candidate after the European election uh, to the parliament, directly to the parliament and not anymore by the European Council. The second article on the Treaty of the Functioning of the EU is to uh, allow the European Parliament to adopt an individual motion of censors against a commissioner a single commissioner and not the entire college of the commissioners. Why I'm, I'm starting to uh, with this, uh, I mean, current situations and, and current work of the European Parliament, just to remind, of course, that the, in politics, I mean, as all we know, the results has never a single father. And uh, my opinion is that uh, the, the reform, the work that President Robles uh, did uh, was uh, strongly engaged with this uh, uh, principle. So before entering in the moment in which uh, he, uh, he worked as a press, first as a member of the European Parliament, then as a president of, 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 um, of the body, uh, I would like just to describe very briefly who he was, I mean, in terms of his, uh, of his ideas and the way in which he developed his uh, European values and his political idea. I mean, I, I'm interested in showing you uh, very briefly, uh, which is the connections between his political life in Spain and the way in which he transformed this experience, the experience he made at national level and how he brought it uh, uh, to the sovereign national uh, structure. So, uh, I mean, Gil Robles uh, uh, started working still under the Franco regime. Uh, he was a legal advisor, I mean, he graduated in law uh, and he was a legal advisor in the Spanish quarter. So under an undemocratic, regime. And, but from there, uh, he was a legal advisor of the Spanish Cortes, and he had the chance to study parliamentary law. And I think that there he started to be strongly, I mean, fascinated, he developed in a comparative perspective, uh, the role of, um, fascinated by the role of, uh, of democratic parliament uh, under the liberal democratic model. And so he devoted a lot of his uh, um, strength in understanding and, and, and coping with the concept of uh, political uh, representation 
representation. So political representation and legislative power. These were two uh, issues he was uh, tackling. Uh, then if we go on, uh, on his European ideas, I mean, he belonged to uh, a small association in Spain, which, which had a very great impact, which was the Spanish Associations for European Cooperation. Uh, I mean, it was a sort of a democratic political laboratory, I would say, still under the regime, where high educated people moderate opposition to the dictatorship, developed the European uh, values and they were talking about Europe, what Europe is, what Europe was, they were commenting the Treaty of Rome and they were developing inside uh, a sort of federalist view of Europe. I mean we, we were in the 60s and in the 60s still uh, there was uh, I mean a resounding idea of the possibility of creating a United States of Europe, this was in the international uh, international debate. So what was uh, uh, Europe for, for him, for the association but in general, I would say, for the ruling class of the Spanish transition to, uh, to democracy. There was a strong association between European values and democracy. As you know, uh, uh, Europe did not accept to open negotiations with the Franco regime. When Franco tried to open in 1962, uh, he presented a request of uh, opening uh, um, negotiations with, uh, with the AEC. So Europe represented for the opposition, for the entire opposition, uh, a defense of human and political rights and adoptions of democratic value and adoptions of the parliamentary system, legalization of political parties, trade unions, uh, and so on and so forth. So Europe is a model. Europe is freedom. It's in an aspiration for their political program. So Jim Robles had very clearly in mind all these things which accompanied uh, his life, his political life, both in national terms and in sovereign national terms. I mean, he took part in the clandestine party still under the regime. Uh, it was called a Democracia Social Cristiana. It was a very small party, but the ideology was the Christian democracy. He also joined the Directive Council of the European Christian Democracy. Then when, if we move to the uh, transition to democracy, so after the, uh, the end of the Franco regime, uh, I think that he did not play, I mean, a fundamental party role in brackets uh, in, in, uh, in the transition to democracy. Uh, I mean, because he's, he kept on defending Christian democratic values, uh, but he played, yes, in this field, he played a great role in cultural and intellectual realm, and also from the institutional point of view. I mean, as we know, uh, Christian democracy as a political party uh, didn't raise during the moment of the uh, transition to democracy. There was no space for a Christian democratic party in Spain. So, uh, I mean, but, but, there was, uh, but there was a great room for uh, the intellectual uh, uh, meaning of, uh, of democracy and the values that Christian democracy uh, was bringing. So, uh, I mean, he uh, participated in the review called, uh, in a review called Quadernos para el Dialogo. Uh, he participated in a group uh, that was called the Tacito Group. Uh, and there was uh, a way, I would say, from the Christian democratic perspective to socialize democratic concept. Uh, then he also from the institutional uh, point of view, uh, he had a role because he contributed in drafting the electoral law, the electoral law that in 19, uh, 1977 uh, uh, made Spain to uh, have the first uh, democratic elections. If I go back to Quadernos para el Dialogo, something that he, 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 he edited a special issue on this, still under the Franco regime, but I think it was resounding even later, it was debated uh, in, in Spain. Uh, it was a special issue on uh, um, the problem problem of regionalism at European level. Of course, I mean, Jill Robles had in mind uh, the Spanish case, but it was uh, very much focused on the importance of regional policy at European level uh, in favor of less developed regions and he sponsored a European process of regionalizations. I mean, the idea behind is that uh, democracy is connected with uh, uh, representation and with redistribution of power at local level. So uh, also from the regional level, it deserved to hold uh, administrative administrative and political power, something that will be part of, uh, uh, I mean, of European institutions in, in the middle of the 80s, I, I, I would say. So just one uh, quick remarks on his uh, relations then with uh, the popular party in Spain and his entrance in the, uh, in the European uh, popular party. Um, 
I mean, he went on trying, as I said, to relaunch the idea of the Christian Democratic Party. And in the end, uh, in 1989, it was, uh, uh, it was called actually by uh, the Partido Popular and this candidacy was proposed as a candidate for the European Parliament. He was twice elected, both there and then uh, in 1994. And then uh, the following year, he entered the popular, more uh, directly entered the popular party in Spain. Uh, what was his idea? I mean, he, he always, uh, I think that he always wanted to interpret the soul of the center, uh, the idea that inside the popular party in Spain, there should be, be uh, a part, uh, I don't want to call it a current, but just a part, uh, an intellectual part uh, devoted uh, to uh, Christian democratic ideas. And so he spread the same issues uh, at the level of, uh, uh, of the European popular party when immediately he entered in the national executive. In 1997, so we enter the period we are more interested in today, which is the moment in which he holds, he was uh, chosen for uh, the European uh, Parliament. Uh, as it has been uh, said uh, uh, previously, I mean, during uh, his presidency, the, what we were uh, dealing with, uh, uh, with the Amsterdam Treaty uh, uh, negotiations. And he saw he had uh, four major concerns, uh, which were uh, how to cope with, the, in, with an issue, which was an issue, a fundamental issue, was and still still is uh, for the European Parliament, which is the, the democratic deficit. Then he was coping with the European Monetary Union, the enlargement and the Santer, uh, Santer resignations, how to cope with this. So I'll go briefly inside these four points and then we open for the debate, of course, on this. Um, so um, again, the problem, democratic deficit connected to the problem of representation. And the idea is that the political action is connected to this. He, he, for, for him, the role of the parliament, both at national level and at sovereign national, so you move it to the sovereign national structures, is not, a legi not only a legislative, but it has also the budgetary power. So the parliament, the European parliament, is, uh, is the, is the, has the, the power, I mean, to, uh, uh, to control the governing body, to control how uh, the, uh, the public money are spent. This is one of its tasks, because in this way, we are closer to European citizens. Uh, he wanted to reinforce democratic representation uh, by adopting a common principle for the European elections. And again, this is something under debate still nowadays, because I remind you that uh, according to the Treaty of Rome, I mean, the Treaty of Rome called for the Assembly uh, to draw a proposal in uh, 1957 for elections by direct and universal suffrage in accordance to a uniform procedures in all the member states. So this is something uh, that he had in mind, I mean, to eliminate the several distinctions we have. We know that we vote in different moments under different uh, um, electoral systems, uh, a different age uh, inside uh, inside Europe. And, and G. Robles was much concerned about how to uh, just to cope with these issues. So he wanted also to create a statute for the members of the European Parliament, and he wanted to simplify the treaties and the normative acts. He also addressed another issue, another important issue, which was the distinction between compulsory and non-compulsory expenditure, uh, because he wanted, of course, uh, to, um, to be able to make uh, uh, more, more amendment, the, the, the EP was able to make more amendment in all areas uh, of the EU spending, and he wanted to overcome uh, the European budge, uh, budgetary reach. Um, if I go, I, I remember I've read uh, uh, his investiture speech, and immediately there he went, uh, I mean, he, he connected all these issues together uh, by quoting the Maastricht Treaty. Uh, the Maastricht Treaty uh, was, uh, was a mistake for him. I mean, some of the resolutions taken, some of the decisions taken in Maastricht, uh, because uh, the role of the parliament uh, involvement in, in the second pillar in foreign security and defense uh, is, uh, uh, um, I mean, is, is minimum. I mean, it's not existing. Uh, only the chance to uh, hold an annual pro formal debate on security and, and foreign policy. So his idea is that both the second pillar and the third pillar should in time be uh, put more under federal rules. I mean, should, they should, uh, should have to, 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 to get rid, to eliminate, to overcome uh, the, the issue of, uh, uh, of the veto power of, uh, of nation state. Uh, if I move briefly to the, what he thought about the European Monetary Union, it was connected, of course, again, with democratic deficit, was connected with representation. The idea is that uh, the economic and monetary union imply not only common currency, but also common uh, economic common policy. And so the idea is that the European Parliament should uh, have a closer link with nation 
national parliament and also should have more contact with the uh, nearly established uh, European Central Bank. Uh, then, if I go to the enlargement, of course, the enlargement is a very key issue in his, uh, in his reflection, in his mind, and also in his uh, political action. Uh, he has, it, the enlargement has a several meanings. First of all, we remind he, he is a Spanish uh, uh, representative. So the idea of enlargement and Europe as uh, spreading democratic values is, uh, uh, is something that is, uh, is in, in, in his DNA, I would say. Now, I'm quoting from one of his discourse. He said, uh, uh, with respect to the Spanish, uh, sorry, with respect to the enlargement towards Central and Eastern Europe, he said, as a Spanish, I'm perfectly aware that integration not only had an economic value, but a primary political and historical meaning. I mean, the historical meaning that he has experienced in his own country. Then enlargement uh, is also connected with the value of Europeanism that were spread uh, by the Catholic families in the 50s. I mean, for Gil Robles, it was a sort of wrap up of the end of the Cold War. It was a way of completing the project of the, of the 50s and to make peace to be full, fully established in the entire old continent. I mean, not only West and East, uh, just, uh, just to think it as a single continent. And also, if we move uh, I mean, to the current situations uh, of, the, of the role of the, of the EU, it was also a way uh, to increase the external role of the European Union. It was something that, uh, from the end of the Cold yeah. War, is something that is uh, living inside the European uh, institutions. And also, after the Maastricht Treaty, he had already in mind the idea that the role of the high representative, connecting to the foreign policy, of course, and uh, defense issues, should be uh, more... Uh, um, more should have more power, that the high representative should have more power. And, and this idea was that he has to be part of the EU executive. Uh, I mean, as we know, uh, uh, he was uh, uh, in Amsterdam, he was decided to be vice president, but not having the status of sitting in the executive. So Jim Robles was contesting uh, this, these issues as well. Uh, then in, in the concept of enlargement, he also had uh, gave a role uh, to, the, uh, to the issue of uh, Solidarity. I mean, solidarity was underlying. It was not a way of making permanent, uh, permanent sub, uh, subsidies. Uh, the idea of solidarity is a Christian solidarity is a Christian democratic values, and it means to share the burden according to the possibility each member has. But it was not something permanent. So it was trying. It was saying this. It was also was addressing is the politician in Spain who were, who were quietly uh, in 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 some moment. Uh, I mean, skeptical about some of the issues that could have been taken uh, with respect to the uh, central and its enlargement, with respect to foundings, uh, uh, delivery, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, so this uh, were uh, his, own, uh, his own ideas, so solidarity and cohesion that belongs to the trajectory that I uh, just am depicting uh, about is uh, um, also the uh, democratic values that inspired his activity. The last point is uh, the Santer resignations. As you all know, the uh, European Parliament has the, exclusive, the exclusive authority to grant a discharge. And again, the purpose is to verify the accuracy of the Commission in budgetary management. Uh, the issue came in March 1999. We had the allegations of mismanagement of uh, uh, European funds. Uh, and. Uh, and after a defeated motion of censors, uh, the EP uh, decided to convene the, a temporary committee of inquiry. Uh, and, uh, and, and then after uh, the investigations made uh, internally, uh, the, uh, the committee declared that the commissions didn't feel responsible for, what, uh, for, for, uh, for the allegations of uh, mismanagement. Um, uh, here, uh, the European Parliament could have, had, uh, could have made another motion, another motion and uh, according to uh, to an interview uh, uh, that I did uh, uh, many years ago uh, to, uh, to Gil Robles in, uh, in Madrid. Uh, I remember, I mean, he said that reaching this time uh, for, with, a second, uh, uh, with a second motions, they could have reached the majority, counting also uh, with the socialist vote. So, of course, uh, this is something that pressed the Santer Commission uh, to just to act uh, without having, uh, having, without being completely pushed by, uh, by the European uh, 
uh, by the European uh, Parliament. Uh, so uh, the Commission, uh, um, what the parliamentary wanted to, to do uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this episode of the Santer resignation was uh, to make clear uh, that the Commission should have the parliamentary legitimacy and should allow so the Parliament uh, to exert the power of financial control and the power of the uh, political action. So I think that uh, uh, during his mandate, also, uh, I mean, thanks to this, uh, to defending, uh, in brackets, I mean, but to, to defending, yes, uh, the budgetary authority of the European Parliament, uh, it was raised, uh, he was able to raise uh, the uh, institutional political standing of uh, the European Parliament. And I think and now I'm finishing that what we are discussing nowadays, the proposal I mentioned at the beginning are very close, uh, I mean, connected with uh, what G. Robles did during his period of time uh, here as a president of the European Parliament. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Cavallaro. First of all, for staying within the time, that's very helpful. But secondly, also for bringing out what I find particularly interesting about your presentation, the importance of both the institutional politics in which Robles was well-versed, but also the importance of his political thinking, and particularly his thinking, which went back a long time to the 1960s, as you brought out about democratic representation, both in a Spanish and in a European context and uh, the way in which his thinking was also informed by some principles of Catholic social thinking in terms of thinking about solidarity, for example. Now we move on now to the panel and we have two panelists, two eyewitnesses, and the idea is to combine both the perspective of a former member and the perspective of a former official here, and ideally also, and we've managed to do this today from different political party perspectives. So I'm welcoming again now after Etienne Basso has already welcomed you, of course, uh, Enrique Baron Crespo, who was president of the European Parliament at the turn from the Cold War to the post-Cold War period in 1989 to 1992. You were first elected to the Cortes, of course, in 1977 and became a minister for transport and tourism in the Gonzalez government of 1982 and then a member of the European Parliament in 1986. Uh, so you have, of course, a long um, commonalities with uh, Gil Robles, both in terms of the transition to democracy, as well as Spanish politics and then European Parliament politics as well. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you about your own memories and experiences of working together with him. And then uh, after you, uh, you want to would like to speak, I understand, from the lectern. And after you, it's uh, Jaume duk Giot, sorry, uh, who is the Director General for Communications in the European Parliament Administration nowadays and uh, has been the spokesperson for the European Parliament since 2006. And you were, and that's the reason why we've invited you and why you've kindly agreed to come here today, you were between 1997 and 1999 also the spokesperson of the then president, Achel Robles. So you can talk about your experience from the perspective of a, a younger than nowadays official working with him directly uh, in the cabinet. So um, if you, Baron Crespo, would go first, that would be very nice. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, Jose Maria Gil Robles was a sound man, a man of sense. I think this is the best definition of Jose Maria. And I will concentrate uh, my remarks on three moments of our common endeavor, our our shared political loves. We, he was a little older than me, nine years, but uh, we were not only working in the transition, we were fighting against the dictatorship. And uh, we met, I think, in the, at the end of the 50s, beginning of the 60s, when the new generation that had not taken part in the civil war was trying to first to make again Spain a democratic system. 
in a democratic society. Overcoming this civil war that was, well, it was not only a Spanish civil war, it was a part of the European civil war. Yeah. And uh, secondly, uh, we, we were, we share the and they were in the view that we had to come back to Europe, to a Europe that was united, uniting itself after the defeat that represented the Second World War, the second civil war of Europeans in the, in the 20th century. And then I will concentrate this in three uh, remarks. First, we met in the <clears throat> university and at the same time in the Colegio de Abogados de Madrid that was a platform in which uh, lawyers we were fighting, for example, first for uh, respecting human rights, uh, fighting for political uh, prisoners, and uh, with Jose Maria, uh, and uh, his uh, brothers, uh, <clears throat> Jaime, that uh, passed away some years ago, and Álvaro, that was uh, later on a very important uh, man for the Council of Europe in the, <clears throat> in the Caucasus, in Georgia. Yeah? So, it was a, <laughs> we, we were sharing all these, all, all these uh, values and these fightings. Uh, then, uh, we were actively conspiring, meeting, and fighting for democracy. Well, he was a Christian Democrat. I am uh, a social Democrat. We were rebuilding the political democratic families in Spain. And, uh, well, not to be too long, but it is interesting uh, point is that Jose Maria had to pay a very high price because, well, this is not only Spanish uh, habitude, but he had the same name, Christian name and family name that his father, Jose Maria Gil Robles, Quiñones, and, uh, well, and he was Gil Robles Gil Delgado. You know that Spaniards, we have the, the family name uh, of the father we keep and the, the mother. Uh, and then for the Spanish, uh, Franco uh, regime, the name of Gil Robles was a hated name. You cannot, he, he was not communist, he was not a leftist. But I remember, and uh, uh, in a very uh, famous process in 1973, I was a young uh, a lawyer, uh, in the 1001 process, that, it was a process on the special court against uh, trade unionists. And uh, Jose Maria Gil Robles' father was a lawyer. I was one of the members. And, and Joaquin Ruiz Jimenez, perhaps that some people know, remember him. He was one of the, uh, he had been minister of Franco, but he was a key man in the dialogue and the transition. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, it was the same day that uh, the vice president, the number two of Franco, uh, went to heaven because he, he was, it was uh, an attempt and he, well, the, the car was bombed. Yeah? Yeah, we will remember, yeah? And, uh, well, they interrupted the, 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 the trial and uh, I remember that there were some radical members saying, Gil Robles, Ruiz Jiménez and others, you are cowards, we will, we, you, are, you are against uh, the system, you are, uh, we will kill you. And then Gil Robles' father, he said, don't, be, don't fear them, they are cowards. But this is, this is important because Jose Maria, that was a man of peace and a sound man, he had to suffer whole, his whole life the fact of having the same name of his father. And he was very proud of it because his father 
had big responsibilities in the Second Republic, but he was a Democrat. And uh, he had to pay, for example, a price, and uh, my second uh, uh, reflection is on the European movement. You know that we shared the fight for democracy in Spain. He was candidate in the elections, the first democratic elections of 77. I was elected, he was not elected. But he, as uh, Juris Consult of the uh, Congress, he, he, he worked for the Constitution. And by the way, we are celebrating today the 45 years of the Spanish Constitution, the longest Constitution that we have had. And Europeans, we, you know that we are, we are, we have a strong competition on how many constitutions we have made. Eh? So for us, it's a question of, of pride, and we share this, but uh, uh, we, we had, since the constitution, we, we went on uh, working for reinforcing and making Spain a democratic country. And this, is, this was a part of our joint endeavor. The second reflection I want to make is I was elected uh, president of the European, International European Movement in, 18, in 1987. He was elected uh, uh, some years ago, some years after, uh, because my successor was Valéry Giscard d'Estaing. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I upgraded the, <laughs> the European movement, uh, and after Mario Suárez, and by the way, Jose Maria, he, had, he was living, he, had, he was a neighbor of Estoril. Yeah, he, he spoke Portuguese, and uh, well, he was very fond of, of Portugal because his father was in exile. And, for example, when the Congress of Europe met in 1947 in The Hague, his father wanted to go. And then he tried to travel, and the, the dictator of Portugal, Dr. Oliveira Salazar, he said to him, if you go, you will, ne will not fly back or travel back. Yeah, this was the situation, yeah. And uh, he was, we shared the European movement, and by the way, uh, uh, I have suggested to, asked to our former members association and to the library, well, to present the minutes of the Congress of 1947 that is the birth of the democratic Europe. And it's almost unknown. Uh, and I think this Congress chaired by Winston Churchill and with uh, Paul Van Zeland and uh, Paul Renault and Konrad Adenauer, yeah? And uh, the Hallstein, the first time the Germans came, came out of the zones, I think it's important for the young people and for the members of this house to know this. And we have made an edition in Spanish translating the minutes. I, when he was elected president of the European Parliament, I had got the minutes and I offered the minutes to him. And we published, the, the European Parliament published the, the, a book with the minutes of the Congress of 47 with a foreword of uh, Jose Maria Giroves and a study that I, I offered to him. I was no more president, and then it was not signed, my, my speech. No problem, yeah, yeah. Sic transit gloria mundi. Eh? But, but I think this is a very important document, and uh, I think that the library must, uh, it would be very good for the, well, for the current members and for the future to, to have this. And then we, we were working together. There were some uh, people, some friends, that uh, said that we were, uh, 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 what we call in Spanish, pareja de hecho, 
that we were not married, but we were always working together in all the stages. Well, uh, we, we went on always working for democracy in Spain and for democracy in Europe. And a brief comment, if I'm, uh, I have time, yeah. A, a brief comment on the crisis of the Commission. Well, this, this crisis, well, you know that democracy is built through crisis. The, the Parliament began to be powerful when after the election of Simone Weil, they voted against the budget. Then they, normally they take you seriously. And Jose Maria had to suffer our crisis of uh, becoming grown up parliament. It was a crisis that, that was not, well, all crises are not properly managed. You know that, that, that there is some chaos. I think that he had a behavior that honored him personally in the parliament. That was not well understood, even by some of his close friends. Well, this makes people more uh, greater and uh, more important in history. And I want to remember this. And uh, to end, I had the privilege to pay him a visit in the, <clears throat> in the Clinica Ruber, in the hospital in Madrid. The day after he passed away, we had uh, a meeting and the uh, vice president of the former members, Moni Gavaldi, told me he's in a very serious situation. And we went together with some uh, friends, with Alonso Puerta, the uh, vice president of the parliament. I, I think it's important in life to say goodbye or see you later to friends. And I had this privilege and I, I keep him in my heart. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for sharing your memories and also for this moving end to your speech. And we will now move on to someone who uh, worked with him very closely as an official, of course, at the time. And uh, you can perhaps speak more concretely about how exactly it was to work with Robles as a president of the European Parliament. Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, thanks for uh, inviting me. I'm really happy being here. Sorry for having been a little bit late, but it's a very busy day here in the European Parliament. Um, in any case, yeah, I mean, uh, how was working with him? Uh, from one side, it was difficult because uh, he was someone very well prepared for being president of the parliament, which meant that people around should also be well prepared to help him, to support him. But at the same time, it was easy because uh, it was a friendly ambience in the cabinet. I'm not going to compare with any other cabinet because this is the only one that I really knew. Uh, but I must say that it was even pleasant to work. We had to work as met for two and a half years. I always will remember that when uh, this period started, people told me, don't worry, this is about one and a half years. And then once the last budget will be adopted, you, the whole cabinet and the president, you will become a lame duck. And then there will be time enough for trips to China and to Japan and to Australia. And you will enjoy a lot. And you will, let's say, in some way, uh, rest from, uh, from the, the, the one and a half uh, years activity. But uh, this was completely wrong. This is not what happened at all. I mean, we were uh, really working quite hard during two years. And when we thought, OK, now the last six months maybe will be a, a little bit easier, then the crisis of the Commission started, and this was the most busy period probably in his life and for sure in my life. Um, but what I would like to say about uh, Jose Maria now, so going back to his uh, period as President of the Parliament, is that our feeling was that as he was preparing himself for becoming President of the Parliament his whole life. Uh, of course, you cannot choose being the president of the parliament there are three former presidents here and you know that uh, i mean you will 
get the presidency or not, depending on many factors, and you cannot control most of these factors. But sometimes it happened. Uh, if you look to his biography, and Professor Cavallaro was, uh, uh, was mentioning this, he started, for, uh, he started being a senior official of his own parliament. Okay, the Cortes at that time, yeah, a parliament, let's uh, call it like that. Uh, at least the time that he was not banned, because he was under disciplinary measures a couple of times during, uh, during this uh, period in the national parliament. He was a legal advisor, he was a lawyer, he was professor of political law. And then in the European Parliament, before becoming president of the parliament, he was first chair of the institutional committee, so the constitutional committee right now, and then also vice president for several years. So the day that uh, he reached the presidency of the parliament, he, let's say, he was ready to start from the first minute because uh, uh, he got the experience, he got the training, uh, he got all the necessary contacts and the network to do that. And then the second element, in my opinion, and this more or less, has been also uh, evident uh, during uh, the two previous speeches is how institutional he was. Um, and of course this was maybe another time and uh, probably uh, the former presidents in this room, they know what I mean. Um, you can be president in many ways. Uh, and at that time, I would say that most of the presidencies were very institutional. So very so far from being partisan, fra far from, uh, let's say, entering into the internal politics in a, let's say, yeah, in a partisan way. Uh, um, with him, uh, it was exactly the opposite, and sometimes this created difficulties uh, to him. Um, I don't know what uh, Mr. Baron, Mr. Hunch, Mr. Pettering think, but uh, you see one, you see when a president is institutional and is neutral when he starts having difficulties with his own political group. This is exactly the moment where you can see that this person is really defending the institution and protecting the institution because, and this is logic, this is natural, people from your own political group will always think that you, in some at some point will try to favor this political group or to help a little bit more this political group than the others. When you chair, for example, uh, the Conference of Presidents or when you chair the Bureau, this never happened. And because this never happened, it's true that sometimes he had quite a lot of difficulties with his own uh, political uh, family. Um, it was also quite clear that uh, this would be an institutional and a very neutral presidency in the way that he composed his cabinet. The fact that more or less, more than, yeah, more than half of the cabinet, we were staff of the house. We were not staff of the political groups. We were staff uh, of the administration, including myself. And I still remember that uh, when he decided to select someone uh, to be uh, his press advisor, not his spokesman. I made the same mistake when I arrived to the, uh, to the cabinet. So I'm the spokesperson, and the answer by the head of cabinet was no. You are the press officer. The spokesperson is the president. Uh, and, this, and this was pretty clear for two and a half years. Um, but uh, when we arrived there, we saw that, uh, yes, most of us, we came from the administration, and I was selected because he also said, I don't want a press advisor coming from my political group. I want a press advisor coming from the administration because this will also be the way to show to the journalists that n now I'm not anymore the member of my political group. I am, but not, not in an effective way. I'm the president of the whole uh, institution. Uh, it was also quite obvious in her relationship with his own party and, by the way, also his own government in Spain. There were also difficulties with the Spanish government, uh, with President Jose Maria Aznar at that time. Again, because he was protecting the institution sometimes from the typical political maneuvers, for example, in the case of the meetings uh, of the European uh, Council. I can say that he was also an uncomfortable president for the European Council, for the heads of government and state. Uh, he was probably one of the first presidents, I wouldn't say the first, but one of the first presidents to engage in discussions with the European Council, and some of these discussions were, were quite difficult. I still remember one of them uh, in the European Council uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Wales, 
when 11 heads of government took the floor to protest against uh, the way the parliament organized uh, the, the rights and the duties of the members. And he had to defend uh, the institution against 11 heads of government, which is quite a lot of people, because at that time there were only 15 member states. So only four or heads of government didn't take the floor at that time. Um, and then, of course, there have been mentions uh, to the in crisis with the Commission, uh, uh, to, the, to the Commission resignation, and for sure this was the most difficult time for him, uh, because he was a very good friend of President Santer, and he was an extremely close friend uh, of uh, uh, Commissioner Marcelino Oreja, who, by the way, was the Commissioner in charge uh, of the relations with the European Parliament. And... Uh, Human, from a human point of view, it was pretty clear, it was obvious that he was suffering uh, about this situation uh, and that he had two possibilities. One possibility to try to defend President Santer and the whole College of Commissioners and to try to find a kind of a half arrangement and to try to uh, convince uh, Pauline Green, who was uh, the president of the uh, Socialist Political Group at that time, and others to try to find the way to escape to this situation. But he didn't do that. Uh, he was, in, from this point of view, again, uh, a very institutional president, even if, as President Baron said, this uh, put his uh, friendly, uh, I mean, his relationship with some friends at stake for quite uh, a long time. And now looking uh, to what happened in 1999 in the perspective of uh, 25 more years, I think that this was the right decision because we all uh, saw how the relationship between the Commission and the Parliament changed because uh, uh, of this uh, crisis and because of the fact that, yeah, there was no censorship, uh, there was a resignation, but this resignation was provoked, was created by uh, the European Parliament. And even the way... Uh, of, uh, let's say, um, creating a working relationship between not just politicians, but also officials from the Commission and the Parliament change uh, since uh, that uh, day. Then uh, let me just uh, add a couple of things, maybe also because of uh, this institutional profile, maybe also because of this long, long experience from a legal uh, political point of view, uh, he... Uh, he made uh, as one of his priorities uh, the intergovernmental conference for the Treaty of Amsterdam. Uh, he took part in all kind of meetings, including ministerial meetings that I would say were not maybe at the level of the president of the parliament. He attended all these meetings. He worked as a kind of lawyer, if you want, or diplomat in those meetings uh, with uh, a very concrete list of uh, requests uh, from the side of the European Parliament. Not all of them, of course, uh, went uh, into the final text of the Treaty of Amsterdam, but some of them, yes. And one of them that maybe people forgot uh, was uh, the legal basis for the uh, member's st statute. And this was very important because until that time, most of the criticism against the members and against the institution was produced by the fact that there were uh, inequalities, inequalities in the European Parliament because the members of the Parliament in some way depending, depended depend on the uh, national and not the European statute. So they were linked in many ways to the national Parliament and not to the European Parliament. And of course this created, let's say, 15 different categories of being a member of the European Parliament. And this is why this possibility of having a legal basis, of having an article in the treaty allowing the European Parliament to start preparing the statute to be then adopted by the Council was so important. It took quite a lot of time. This was only under President Boré's mandate that this uh, statute was adopted. But this changed many things. And I think that for Jose Maria Girobles, the most important element here was to protect and to enhance the independence of the members of the European Parliament. If you have your own 
statute, if you don't depend on the national statute of a member of a national parliament, you are not a kind of national member who is deputizing in the European Parliament. You are a fully fledged member of the European Parliament. And this is what changed uh, thanks uh, to this uh, legal basis and then, of course, to the adoption of the statute a couple uh, of years ago. And then maybe just a couple of last uh, elements from my side. First, as I said at the beginning, it was quite a busy period. It was not just about the Treaty of Amsterdam. It was also about the adoption of Agenda 2000, so how to pave the way for the enlargement to the uh, Central and Eastern Europe countries, and this was quite a long discussion. Uh, uh, it was also uh, about uh, the decisions on the single currency. I remember the only time in history that Parliament uh, met in plenary in a Saturday here in Brussels to adopt the resolution uh, on uh, the entering into force of the single currency the same day as the European Council would adopt the same uh, measure in the afternoon. Uh, and of course, as I said before, it was also about the Commission uh, resignation. Uh, there are two other things that uh, President Gil Robles had as priorities in his mandate. One was to use his position to better explain to other countries what exactly meant the ETA terrorism in Spain. These were still the years where in some countries uh, it was difficult to understand the reality of um, the terrorism actions by ETA, uh, starting, by the way, by one of our neighbor countries. Uh, President Gil Robles used any possible opportunity to explain to other Europeans what terrorism in Spain meant. Starting, by the way, with her first speech when he was elected, one of the elements of his uh, inaugural speech was exactly uh, about that, about terrorism. And then, during these two and a half years, sadly, unfortunately, there were other opportunities to remind this uh, to the members uh, of the European Parliament. And second, it was also about the peace process in Northern Ireland. And this is something that has not been uh, studied already. At least I didn't see until now any paper about this. He was, for a couple of months, he was playing quite a role, uh, first in um, obtaining from the European Union the creation of the uh, Peace Process Program, the Peace Process Project, which in fact was how to fund uh, uh, Northern Ireland in a way that this would help both communities to start uh, speaking each other. And he even went to Belfast, where I remember he had meetings at the same time with Ian Paisley and with John Hume. And I think this was maybe one of the first and very few times where both uh, Hume and Paisley, Paisley were uh, talking uh, each other. Uh, at some point, there was even the idea to ask President Hill Robles to become a kind of mediator at some point, this idea was forgotten, but uh, this uh, took quite a lot of his time uh, for uh, several months. Uh, voila. And then maybe linking to what uh, President Baron said and Professor Cavallaro said, let me just end with a sentence that he repeated uh, to his officials, and there are three of them here. Almost every day uh, when we were, let's say, losing our patience, when we were uh, disappointed about something that went wrong or when we thought that it would be impossible to get our results and he always repeated the same sentence the good ideas have legs and this is exactly what happened with many of his ideas you can see now that some uh, of the achievements of this house were in some way started by President Hill Robles, who, by the way, inherited them from President Baron, from President Hench, because each president is in some way a section of the chain. And uh, yeah, these ideas, these good ideas had legs, and some of them now are realities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you in particular, I think, for pointing out the importance of the member statute, uh, which I think connects back to these uh, questions of representation, democratic representation, that you had been preoccupied with for a very long time. 
Um, and I get the impression from all the three presentations that to some extent Rui Robles was always a little bit on the margins. He was clearly on the margins of the PP after he joined, even after he joined the PP. But he seemed to have been quite comfortable with this role uh, for the reason that it allowed him to mediate and to cross bridges and to bring people together, which seems to be something that was very important and dear to him and also important in the way in which he conducted his presidency and the European Parliament. We now have about 20 minutes uh, time for further observations uh, from the audience here and also online. Online, I would like to point out or remind you that you can ask questions in the chat function, please. But we will start with the first um, maybe two or three observations or comments here from the floor. And I would just like to ask everyone to be as brief as possible so that as many of you as possible can contribute or ask questions. And I would like to start with the two other former presidents, of course, in the room, Klaus Hensch and Hans Gepert if you have something that you would like to ask or add. Klaus Hensch, if you want to start. I'm not sure that I have a question because Herr um, Robles has been my successor as president of the European Parliament. And um, as it is always one is looking a little bit more criti critical, critical on the successor because it isn't possible that he's better than you yourself have been. So uh, you, you understand that I have no question. But I think that um, he did not really, um, or I, I had the impression also what I have had, heard, that he did, did not really understand what was necessary for the European Parliament in the quarrel and the mission of the Commission. The Parliament was not in the beginning against the Commission. It, 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 the Parliament was not against Santa as president of the Commission. But uh, the, the, the Parliament realized that the Commission was not able to make its own impact in, in the critics which came out, out of the Parliament because there were two or three commissioners who failed, not only in the, in the, in the normal work, but also in the, in the surrounding uh, of the Commission. And this was, uh, in, in the end, the reason for the demission or the majority to dismiss the commission. This was not, this was a process. It was not simply because we came together and then we said we will have a majority. There was not a majority. The commission and the president of the parliament tried to, to keep it down. And after some months, it was no longer possible, even for those who were um, supporting the Commission and supporting Santa. So this is my impression because on what has been said here. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Can you pass this on to Hans Gerd Petering? Uh, I think Klaus Sench, uh, what he says concerning the resignation of the Santa Commission, and Raume Duck has said uh, good ideas have legs. And if Jacques Santa could have dismissed the former prime minister from France, Edith Cresson, he could have stayed in office. And so I was at that time uh, deputy chairman of my group, so I had no institutional connection with the president of the European Parliament. But after the election 99, I was chairman of the EPPED group, we made an agreement with the incoming new president of the Commission, Romano Prodi, that if a commissioner has not the confidence of the parliament anymore, that he sends this commissioner away. And we made an institutional, interinstitutional agreement, and so uh, we got this right finally. But describing the personality of uh, Jose Maria Gil Robles Gil Delgado, I would say he represented in the best way the dignity. In dignity is English. I checked it. Dignité is French. Dignidad is Spanish, and dignita is uh, Italian. And in my, in our German language, 
it's Würde. And this is a wonderful word, Dignita or Würde. And he represented this. And so Jill Robles, in the best way, represented the Article 1 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, the, the, um, the dignity of the human being is inviolable. It's a very difficult word. I tried it several times, inviolable. And I think Jill Robles in the best way represented this. My second point is always will be the Amsterdam Treaty be connected with uh, Jose Maria Gil Robles. He believed in democracy, he believed in parliamentarism, and with the Treaty of Amsterdam, we did not get more, many more majority voting in the council, but we got in all cases, almost all cases where there was a majority voting in the council, we got the co-decision, and this was a great success, and this was totally in line with um, the President Gil Robles Gil Delgado. And my last point is, he was a person whom you could trust. And I tried to telephone with a former colleague, his name is Edgar Schiedermeyer. He was from Bavaria, six years in the European Parliament. And when uh, Gil Robles was candidate to become President of the Parliament, uh, we had a discussion whether he is the right person. And Edgar Schiedermeyer said, he will behave like a bishop. And there is some truth in it, and I think his deep Christian belief is part of this uh, uh, description. And uh, I think as a human being, I must say, one really could rely on Jose Maria de Robles. One could trust him. And that's why I always will keep his memory in the best way in my mind and my heart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, perhaps and to conclude the first round, Monica Baldi and also, of course, uh, Dominic Ruiz. Okay. First, I do. Yeah. No, just few words. Thank you, President Enrique Baron Crespo, to remember our last visit uh, to uh, the president I had in my heart. He was president when uh, I was vice president of the Culture Committee, and I remember how he was... Uh, Fantastic. When I was speaking with him about some initiative, about cultural committee and something like that, he was very curious. And every time he was uh, somebody accepting what we are saying, what we are doing. So I remember, for instance, when uh, we call uh, the singer Renato Zero to sing here in the parliament and everybody was impressed. And uh, I mean, it was something very touching. So just to say a few words for me as a uh, uh, President Petring said he he's going to be in my heart always. Thank you. Well, thanks. Um, well, my name is Dominic, a member of the European Parliament. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you uh, for organizing this event. This was really important. I'm very glad. Uh, that from, from the historical section of, of the EPRS and the former members, uh, you have produced this event, which are, is one example of uh, the important work that you do uh, in, this, uh, in this service. And that um, I, I, I trust that, that that will be the case in, in the future. I'd like to say just a couple of words uh, about Jose Maria. I also had the, the privilege to know him later in his life. Uh, Mm, because um, what I like to emphasize about him is that he was like others in this parliament, particularly those um, that have worked uh, more, uh, let's say, strongly from, uh, for the institutional development of the European Union, but not only, uh, that are at I will say at heart, European activists, not only MEPs, not only European politicians. Uh, it is not by chance that he was president of European Movement International at the same time that he was MEP. I believe, I believe Enrique, you had to resign as president of European Movement International when you were elected uh, president of European Parliament. Uh, you, Hans Gert, also were president of uh, Europe, uh, EUD, European Union, Deutschland, at some point, 
uh, I think when you were elected chairman of EPP group, maybe. So, you know, uh, uh, those are mm, not coincidences. Huh? And, and also, and that's where I met uh, Jose Maria, much after uh, ending his political career in the institutions, he was uh, a regular activist in the Spanish European movement. That's where I met him. Huh? And um, I think this is a big example for all of us uh, uh, to have strong pro-Europeans in all political families. They tend to be also the moderates in their political families. I also consider Jose Maria moderate. Uh, and uh, the best way to work in Europe is when you have, uh, in leading roles in the political groups, strong pro-Europeans and moderates. This is the best way uh, to cooperate. And the last thing about him uh, is his generosity. I remember uh, asking him for uh, conferences, always available, writing prologues for books, always available. And an anecdote, uh, once I proposed to sign a federalist uh, uh, manifesto, and he said, well, I don't agree with everything, but I will sign it. Another example. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. For these observations, I would suggest, as they've been contributions and observations and not questions, that we now check whether uh, online participants have got any questions uh, for the panelists. Uh, Gilles Petors, my colleague from the History Service, has checked whether there are any questions online. Could you read um, them out, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, we have one question from Francis Jacobs. He said, I was very interested to hear from uh, Jean Maduch about Guy Robles' involvement in the peace process in Northern Ireland. Did he have an input before the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, or was his emphasis more on building the agreement by the development of supportive EU funding, such as the peace program? Did he see any implications of the Northern Ireland peace process for political developments in the Basque country, or did he think that the situation was too different? That's it online, thank you. Thank you, so I would suggest that uh, you perhaps re reply to this question directly, and anything else that you would like to add first? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. Um, no, these were, these were two different questions. I don't see any connection between both of them. But um, maybe the only connection is that he tried to be uh, useful. Uh, in the case of terrorism in Spain, he was useful in interna internationalizing uh, the real meaning of this conflict to avoid misinterpretations about what was happening uh, in Spain. In the case of Ireland, it wasn't about terrorism at that time. It was about how to, uh, uh, how to activate the Stormont agreement in a way that would be useful for internal politics in Northern Ireland, yes, and for create a better basis for peace. And the other role of the European Union was very important and has been very important until the last day the United Kingdom was a member of the European Union. Uh, perhaps we can uh, see whether there are any more questions or comments from the floor now, and then after that allow for a final round from the panelists. Is there anyone else who would like to ask a question or make a comment? Yes? Yeah, it's not a question. Could I you just... kindly say, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, my name is Isabel Castaño, and I'm coordinating here in Brussels the uh, Alumni Association of the University of Salamanca. Um, uh, I would like to underline the link of Jose Maria Gil Robles to, to his university. He studied uh, in Deusto, the two first years of, of law, his, the law career, but he, finishes in, he finished in Salamanca. And he was very proud of uh, coming from the university, and he knew that it was part of, of his background. And uh, several weeks ago, I came across a book, a very special book, written by a um, 90-year-old man, a very simple man that has worked all his life in, in the countryside in Salamanca. And uh, his name is Ángel González. And the, the book is named uh, Vivencias, Historias y Vivencias de una Vida, kind of memories and experiences of a life. So this man who barely went to school and who, as I said, worked in the countryside in Salamanca from the 40s, the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s of the 20th century, in one of the chapters, 
uh, he says that uh, he was working in Salamanca Finca in a property and in a state uh, where the family was very close friends with the Gil Robles family, with Gil Robles senior, with his father. And uh, even if they lived in Estoril, in Portugal, they used to spend some summers in, the, in this uh, Salamanca property. And uh, the man who wrote this book, who's a very old man now, um, used to work there as a um, uh, uh, herrero. So um, I don't know the word in English, forgeron in French. So he used to work in this property, and he was even asked to do some horse riding to Gil Robles' children when they came to spend the summer. And he tells in the book that uh, in one summer afternoon, he was talking to the priest of the farm and to the Gil Robles' children, asking them, what would you like to do when you will grow up? And Jose Maria, who was the eldest, said he was 15 at that time. It, it is in 1950. And he says, I would like to become a lawyer. He asked the second brother, and he says, I would like to become an aviator. And the third uh, brother says, I don't know, but I don't want to become a politician because my father is getting bold. So um, this is just to, to underline that uh, three years later, he was studying law, and five years later, he was studying law in Salamanca, like his father and uh, like his grandfather also. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing this with us. Uh, I'm surprised, though, that he didn't say that he wanted to become president of the European Parliament. <laughs> now, we have time for a last quick round from the panelists, and let's start with Professor Cavallaro, who's online. Um, feel free to relate to anything that has been said now uh, since the presentations, but try to pre uh, keep your comments brief because we have relatively little time left. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just two comments on something that uh, uh, has comes after my uh, presentation. The first issue is related to uh, is uh, relations with uh, the popular party in Spain. Um, I mean, I completely agree with what has been said with respect also to, um, I mean, not problems, but like uh, not being completely uh, overlapping with the ideas of the popular party in Spain during when he was uh, uh, when he was uh, serving as a president president of the, of the European Parliament. And it's not a case. I mean, Gil Robles entered uh, in uh, 1989, which is the moment in which uh, the party from uh, Alianza Popular uh, became Partido uh, Popular in Spain. And, and, and the idea, uh, again, he had was to find uh, a room for Christian democratic values, something that uh, it was easier to be done in the uh, European, uh, um, uh, in the, in, on the European stage, uh, on, uh, on the European Popular Party, uh, more than uh, in the Popular Party in Spain. We know that the Popular Party in Spain, I mean, historically speaking, uh, is a party that comes from uh, the, uh, I mean, Franco's heritage. Uh, Alianza Popular was the party that has been formed just to keep uh, the legacy in democratic setting, but the legacy of, uh, of the former regime in his, in his very uh, first stage of, of his life. So I think that this is uh, one point to be, I mean, historically to be taken into account. And the last passage, of course, uh, regarding uh, uh, the Santer resignations. Uh, I mean, um, uh, President Baron Crespo was a member of the commission as well, the time Oreja and, uh, and Baron Crespo were the two members, if I if I remember well, uh, of that commission. And and as has been said, again, he had very close contact with Marcelino Oreja, was a sort of his mentor uh, during also this process of entering uh, in, uh, uh, in in the Popular Party in Spain for Jose Maria Robles. So it was a really a, a problematic uh, moment. Uh, but again, I think that this is something that uh, give us the light to see uh, how much she was uh, engaged with the institutional uh, uh, with the institutional path and the institutional meaning of the European Parliament and the idea again is that representation is connected with uh, uh, solving the problem of democratic deficit and belong being close to European citizens being also to control uh, the power of the executive body of the European institution and uh, and, and and he pushed it uh, I mean indirectly uh, but he pushed uh, uh, 
uh, strongly, the, I mean, indirectly strongly, I don't know if it's possible to be said, but this is what, uh, what happened, uh, the uh, Santer, uh, Santer resignation. So I think this is, uh, uh, I mean, this, this deserves to be remembered in the history of European Parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kalma uh, yeah, very, very, very briefly uh, on his, his relationship with his party. Uh, don't forget that the first time that he was elected, he was elected as an independent. He wasn't a member of the party yet. He uh, joined the party a couple of years later, but he accepted to be in the list again because of Marcelino Oreja. At that time, Marcelino Oreja was the head of the list, and there was an agreement between uh, Oreja and Jose Maria Aznar that Oreja would have the possibility to add uh, three people to the list, uh, and the first would be number six. And this was the position that uh, Jose Maria occupied uh, in that list. East, but as an independent, and by the way, it was difficult to convince him. It was not uh, something done in a couple of days. It took some time, but yes, at the end of the day, Marcelino Oreja convinced him, and then at some point he joined the party, and he was a member of the party, I think, until, until he died. Uh, so this also explains a little bit that, yes, sometimes uh, his independency was not just formal, was also real when he, uh, uh, when he spent his, his, his term as a president. On the resignation of the commission, I think that, I mean, we, we know, and by the way, I agree with uh, the way uh, uh, President Hansch also uh, and President Pöttering described that moment. We can maybe say that this was a suicide in some way. The commission is the real responsible of what happened with the commission itself. And maybe if you want to individualize, yes, it was also about Edith Hesson not uh, accepting uh, to resign herself to save the whole uh, team uh, of commissioners. And the parliament at some point was into a situation where it was completely, let's say, unable to save that situation. They tried, for example, because they created this uh, famous Wiseman uh, Committee, which uh, for several months was studying uh, what really happened or didn't happen in the commission and interviewing one per one all the commissioners, including President Santer. But at the end of the day, the report came with this famous sentence saying that nobody in the commission was controlling what happened in the commission. And once this sentence was made public, it was completely impossible to stop the media and, and in some way to, 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 to put this, uh, this uh, snowball uh, to roll uh, down the hill. And then concerning Salamanca, there is maybe just one uh, extra element is that even if he was born in Madrid, uh, when he died, before dying, uh, he decided he asked to be buried in Salamanca. And he is uh, uh, again and back in Salamanca now. Thank you very much. And now the final word is with President uh, Enrique Baum. Well, uh, <clears throat> as an information, the family Gil Robles came from Ciudad Rodrigo, in Salamanca. But I, I want only to comment on uh, an observation made by uh, Jaume Duque, is that you become a president or a, when you have to confront your own people. In your own family. And I think this is a common experience of uh, Klaus Hens and uh, of, of Pöttering. Well, <clears throat> the main question is that you have to take decisions looking to the future. This is the whole history of the European construction. This is an open constitutional process. And, uh, well, I had to take some decisions, yeah, at that time. Well, it was, it was <laughs> the falling of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War, and, uh, and Maastricht. But if you look, the main decisions that have been taken, and this is one of, uh, I think, of the greatness of uh, his personality, because he had to face a very difficult situation. But when you look to how we have been building Europe, eh, well, normally the leaders, they have taken decisions that break with our past. I will mention one that was very important in the, uh, the, uh, after, the, uh, after Maastricht. Well, the Euro. At that time it was the EQ, but the Germans rightly they said it, it looks like a... a, <laughs> a, a, a uh, and uh, we can, but Chancellor call 
made the proposal against the majority of the German public opinion. This, you, you need courage. And, uh, well, now looking to the current situation, if I had the possibility to have a chat with, uh, with Jose Maria Gilrobles, we would be debating on the report that has approved the parliament on the future of the European Union. And I think we, we would agree that we need to make a step forward. And there is a, a man of uh, common sense that we respect very much. At the time of Maastricht, he was director general of the treasury of the Italian Republic, Mario Draghi. Mario Draghi has said in an article in The Economist last week, what we need is a federal state. I share his view, and I think that uh, Jose Maria would agree with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Enrique Baron Crespo, for highlighting also the importance of connecting the past experience with the future. And I think this event has contributed, hopefully contributed to this uh, somewhat as well. Uh, I would like to thank, first of all, of course, all the three panelists here on the panel and also online for their contributions. I would like to thank the other two uh, for, uh, former presidents of the European Parliament, current members of the European Parliament, former members of the European Parliament, and everyone else who has been with us both uh, online and here on site in the reading room. Uh, and I would like to conclude, of course, with the hope, with expressing my hope that we will not have to organize an event like this for many years to come. Thank you very much.